It's always a little bit of a challenge to um, work on some of these sermons when they're like, like Thanksgiving or whatever, because what do you pick to speak on for Thanksgiving? I mean, there's so many things, and you try to keep it from year to year. You try to keep it different a little bit. Um, and so I try that this year again. We'll see how it works out. <laughs> Um, the criteria by which the churches in the first century were measured was by their faith, their hope, and their love. And so our message this morning is going to be Paul's message of thanksgiving for the church at Colossae. So we're taking our lesson from Colossians 1, 3 to 5. Thanksgiving is a special day or a special holiday, um, and it should be special and it should hold great significance um, if we call Jesus our Lord and Savior. It should be dear to our hearts, not only on October 8th, 2023, but every day of the year. It is a time at the end of the harvest season, and therefore a time that we are mindful and grateful for the many blessings of God, for his provision and for sustaining our lives. And so it's called Thanksgiving, a time of special focus on our thankfulness to God, whether it is with the church or family or whatever it is. In our world today, it seems like the significance of Thanksgiving and the purpose of Thanksgiving has waned in the hearts and minds of most individuals. As God is rejected more and more by society, these holidays, along with the Christian principles, wane as well. In fact, if you drive around town, you will see all the Halloween paraphernalia littering the lawns of people's yards. There's talk about Christmas. There's stuff in the store for Christmas already. And you don't hear much on Thanksgiving. But we shouldn't be surprised, I suppose, because... Uh, unless you really believe in God, believe in Jesus, being thankful to him wouldn't make much sense. The truth is that for Christians, for the people of God, each and every day needs to be a day of thanksgiving. God blesses us each day, and so thanksgiving is necessary. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Rather than taking things for granted or, or thinking we deserve things, um, or it's, it is God's will that we are grateful, that we are thankful for them. The first day of the week we gather and we give thanks to God for when we, when we celebrate the Lord's table and we remember Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus and we remember everything that he did for us, including the cross and the grave and the resurrection. This morning, uh, I'm using our passage of scripture from Colossians 1, and we're going to take a look at what we can learn about Paul's thanksgiving for the church. Paul gave thanks to God for the blessing of the body of saints at the church of Colossae. It's a wonderful thing to be part of the Lord's church where born-again people, the saints, are living together in harmony and in unity, and they care for one another, and they love one another. These Christians in Colossae, Paul wrote to, were converts of his from one of his earlier missionary journeys. They were always on his heart and on his mind, and he was ex eternally thankful for them. And in his letter to them, he expresses that thankfulness in three specific areas of their lives. It's quite natural for us as people to think one-dimensional when it comes to situations like Thanksgiving, um, focusing more or less maybe on one thing or on our, ourselves particularly or that kind of thing. But Paul, in this passage, opens up our minds here and says, look, be thankful for the church. Be thankful for everyone, all of the saints, and their, their faith and their love and their hope. So the first one that Paul talks about is faith. Faith in Jesus Christ um, is the channel 
by which our salvation comes. Paul told the Ephesian Christians, he said, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Uh, it is a gift of God, and it's nothing of your own doing. There's not no other way to have salvation. There's no other way to have eternal life. There's no other way to have forgiveness of sins. There's no other way to be purified of your wretchedness. There's no other way that we can enter into the kingdom of God or ever see the face of God, our creator, without faith in Christ Jesus. Faith is so very precious. It's so priceless and unattainable without the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is something so precious that nothing in this world can even come close to comparing with. That is why Paul speaks to us about that, about not letting those who would destroy our soul and take our faith from, don't let them do that. Don't be swindled by the cunning tongues of this world. Don't allow them to swindle you out of your precious salvation in Jesus Christ. Hold on to it and be thankful every day. Hold on to it like it is your life, because it is your life. Faith is also the knowledge that God is in absolute control of everything and everyone and every situation in life. And it doesn't matter where you find yourselves or what you find yourself involved in. God doesn't take a coffee break. God doesn't take a lunch break. God is in full control and looking over all things and protecting all things or working all things to his will every minute of the day because he doesn't work on a time frame like we do. He's outside of time. Some people believe that faith is something intangible, something that is just an expression that you, you can't really comprehend fully or you can't grab onto. That is not true. Faith is very real. Faith is rooted in the knowledge of God's word. Paul told the Christians in Rome that the gospel is for all people, Jew and Gentile alike, but not all will obey the gospel. And then he says in Romans 10 and 17, so faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Faith is real. Faith isn't something that some people get a bug and think, oh, I got faith. Faith is real. It's grounded right here. All of it's right there. Our faith then comes from gaining the knowledge of God and of Christ and of the cross and the resurrection and all of the things that are written down for our learning as God's children. Faith is believing the knowledge of God that we have received from Jesus and his apostles and are recorded in our Bibles. And faith is also the ingredient in Christianity that makes it possible for us to walk the walk of Christ and to talk the talk of Christ. You see, Galatians 2.20, Paul says, and this is one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If there needs to be thanksgiving, we need to be given thanks for that. Amen? We walk with Christ. We don't run ahead of him. We don't lag behind but we walk right alongside of him, trusting and believing that he is the true guide to life and, and eternity, and, and we walk with him by faith. We're relying on his guidance, his leadership through life. So our faith must be in him and him alone. Faith in anything else or anyone else is vain faith. Faith that isn't in Christ will cause us to stumble, will cause us to fall, it'll hinder our walk, and it will lead us astray from salvation. John tells us in 1 John 5 and 4, everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Is it any wonder that Paul gave thanks 
to God for the faith of the Colossian church. Faith like they had and that we have and can have is worthy of our thanksgiving to God without ceasing. But Paul was also, he also gave thanks to God for their love. Where you find God's people, God's faithful people, is where you will find godly love. Romans 5.5, 5, Paul writes, And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Do you realize God's love has been poured into your heart? Isn't that amazing? Having poured his love into our hearts, the expectation then is that we would live and practice that same love that he's done with us, that he has for us. And we would do that with every, for everyone. John tells us in his first epistle all about love and, and the love that Paul was thankful for. And that love, he, he, if you read John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3 and 4, I forget how many times love is mentioned in there, but it's amazing. And I can't read it. I'm not going to read it all, but I'm going to read a couple of passages here. He says, this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So this is an age-old message. It wasn't new when Jesus said that we should love one another. He was quoting an age-old message from God. That's, so that's 1 John 3.11. He also says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and here's the, here's the tough part, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Are you willing to do that? That's the love of God. John, 1 John 3.16. And, and he also writes, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another, 1 John 4, 11. And then, go back a little bit, 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. I don't think I have to say anymore, but I'm going to anyways. We are supposed to find this love in the church. And Paul found it in the church at Colossae, and he gave thanks to God. For that love. If you tie faith together with love, you will see that because of the strong faith the Colossian church had, it motivated them to the practice of God's love with each other. There is no love so pure, so sweet, or so great as the love of God. And that same love that is is supposed to reside in us because he's poured it into our hearts. God's, did you know that God's love is infectious? A lady visited the church years back and, and she came to me at the end of service and she said, I'm in awe. And I said, uh, about what? <laughs> right? She said, it seems like everybody here loves each other. And she said, I've been missing that all my life. I've been missing that in my life. And, and she said, I can't even explain the feelings I have because of what I've seen here. Do you know, God's love is infectious. John tells us that God is love. If we are God's children, then we ought to be love as well. And that love is there to win the dark side over. And you know what? There are so many on that side that want that love of God in their lives. They just don't know how to get there. So God and love and all of that works all together. God has infected us with his love. It is in our veins. It is part of who we are. It was a part of the Colossian church and Paul was thankful for that. My question is, would Paul be thankful for the love of the church here? I'll let you answer that. I believe that all of us here this morning are alive. Would you agree with me? Everybody, you're all breathing, you're all, yeah, you're great. Okay, everybody's alive here this morning. 
The question that I cannot defini definitively answer is are we all alive spiritually? That I don't know and I can't be certain, but God knows and you should know. John writes in 1 John 3 and 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. We've only got two options there with love, don't we? We love or we don't love. If we are honest with ourselves, we would admit that there are times that we have struggled with loving others in the church. And there are times that we have truly appreciated the love of the church in our life. Those things happen because, guess what? We live in a fallen world. But in the church, we ought to become stronger and stronger in that. It usually happens more in times of severe struggles, illness, or, or, or loss of family member or something. I know we appreciate it when we are showing it. Um, and it sounds to me like the Colossian church was living that love in their lives on a daily basis. So my prayer is that with the added special time of this weekend, that all of us, if we don't already love one another, and if we don't thank God for that love, today's a good day to begin doing that in the church, to love as he's loved you and to be thankful to him for the love of the church. May each one of us be filled with the Christian love for each other and may we all give thanks to our God who has made it all possible by giving us his love for each other. And the last thing that Paul talks about that he thanked God for in the Colossian church was their hope. Is there anybody here that has hope this morning? Yeah, well, a couple of hands. <laughs> okay. Um, the first thing we must understand about Bible hope or, or Christian hope is that it is a confident affirmation that God is faithful and that he will complete that which he has begun. It is also therefore the confident expectation which awaits and which we wait for patiently and enthusiastically for God to fulfill. It's the, all the promises, all of those things. So that being true then, it nullifies this idea that people have in the world that hope is some, something that you wish for and, and you're, you're really like, I, wish it's, I, I hope it's going to happen, I wish it's going to happen. That's not what Bible hope is. Have you ever asked someone if they're going to heaven? Try it sometime. You know what answer I get more than anything else? I sure hope so. Folks, wishing you get to heaven isn't going to get you to heaven. Our hope is real. Our hope is solid in Christ. We're not wishing. Our hope is already there. We just have to get there. Hope is rooted and grounded in the word of God, just like faith, believing that it is true and that it is the authority for everyone and that every knee will ultimately bow to him. Hope takes God's word at face value and waits patiently while living it for it to be fulfilled. So we ought to be like Abraham, who in hope believed against hope that he would become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He hoped against all hope. <laughs> this hope speaks of things or a time to come. We don't see it, but we're told about it and we believe it because God is faithful and able and does not lie. His promise is rock solid. It is good. Paul says in Romans 8, 24 and 25, for in this hope we, have, we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it 
with patience. Ultimately, our Christian hope rests in Jesus Christ, his crucifixion or sacrifice, um, his blood shed for our sins to save us from an eternity of hell. This all for the purpose of being restored into a relationship with God, which we chose to fall out of. Our hope confidently looks forward to that day when Christ our Lord comes out of the clouds or in the clouds and takes the church, his bride, to be with him for all eternity. What a glorious day that'll be. What better thought to meditate on this weekend and beyond than the realization of the forgiveness of sins and the promised eternal life that we all have in Christ Jesus. We truly have a lot of blessings from God that we should be eternally giving thanks for. And there is not a better day to start than today. All of that means that we have a hope in a, a real and glorious future. Paul wrote the church at Rome and he said to them in Romans chapter 5 and verse 2, Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Who's excited about seeing the glory of God? Amen? Yeah, let's just get this all over with and let's get there, right? Yours and my hope will one day be realized when we will stand in the Father's presence, in his glorious presence, because Jesus the Christ is our Savior. The, our Lord and our Redeemer. We look forward to that day with a confident expectation it will be fulfilled by God as he has promised us. The Apostle gave thanks to God for this hope that was evident in the Colossian church. And it should be in the Lord's church wherever the Lord's church is found. This is a central hope of the church of Christ, universal who here has this hope this morning? I pray you do, because otherwise, what are you doing? If you are in Christ, your hope isn't found in this world. It can't be found in this world because it's found in him. And there is no hope in this world that's worth having, like the hope that he gives us. So thinking about your eternal hope and add to that eternal hope the hope of every Christian present here today and around the world. We should be on bended knee giving thanks to God. It is the hope that the Colossian church had and that Paul gave thanks to God for. The Christian should be most thankful and great, the most thankful, sorry, and grateful person to ever live on this earth that God created. He has everything from God that pertains to life and godliness. There should not be found on this earth anyone outside of Christ that is more genuine in practices of faith than those who are God's people. If we can't muster up the effort and enthusiasm to thank God for the life that he has blessed us with, I suppose the rocks and hills will cry out in thanksgiving, and that to our shame and regret. This morning we have seen that the Apostle Paul, for all of his hardships in his ministry, for all of the hatred and abuse and everything he went through, and if you want to know about that, read 2 Corinthians 11. But all of that, he said, I thank God for the faith and the love and the hope of the saints in Colossae. I want to encourage the church here wherever people hear this and wherever people hear this sermon, to be like the Church of Colossae. Not the mistakes they made, but the love and the faith and the hope that they had and they practice in their lives every day. And let's remember to have thanksgiving in our hearts and take that thanksgiving to God daily for his church and faith, for his church, the faith and the love and the hope of the church. And so this morning, I wanted to um, just close by reading this poem. It goes like this. Oh, give thank, thanks to him 
who made the morning light and evening shade, source and giver of all good, nightly sleep and daily food, quickener of the weary, wearied powers, God of our unconscious, un, unconscious hours. Oh, give thanks to nature's king who gave life to every breathing thing. He's our warm and sentient frame, his the mind immortal flame. Oh, how close the ties that bind spirits to the eternal mind. Oh, give thanks with word and lip, for we are his workmanship, and all creatures are his care. Not a bird that cleaves the air falls unnoticed, but who can speak the Father's love to man? Oh, give thanks to him who came in a mortal suffering frame, temple of the deity, came for rebel, for rebel man to die. In the path himself has trod, leading back the saints to God. If we can help you this morning with your thanksgiving to God or with any other matter that you are currently being challenged with, or if you have a uh, praise or a glory item, uh, just let it be known while we stand and sing. When upon the 